Hello, it is the morning after our field trip and I was able to export the chat and find the file. Thanks for bearing with me. And um, the in the chat, I found the, some of the questions that I did not get to um, that I missed because there were there were a, a number. So thank you again for those. And I've grouped them. A couple of them were repeats and I want to make sure that I get to all of them. So uh, Donna asked if there is a memory trick, how to keeping types sorted in your mind so you can recall them at real world interactions. Michael asked, how long are you around someone before you identify them? And uh, what I want to say to that is the four letter type code already is a shorthand to remember where, you know, what order the functions are in and kind of what, what behavioral patterns and preferences the person has in terms of communicating, making decisions, processing information, organizing their worldview, and um, that you are going to learn about the 16 types by reading books, by practicing it um, on your friends. But I do want to also share a big caution. So I don't type people. When I interact with people, when I meet someone, I don't I, I might think in my mind, this particular behavior right now looks like that particular function, but I try not to jump to conclusions because I don't know what your type preferences are. I know what my type preferences are. Um, you might only be showing me this one particular facet of yourself during the context that we're in. So I try not to jump to conclusions about, you know, how somebody else is working just by one or two, you know, interactions in a brief moment or in a specific context, because um, like we said, or like we discussed in the, in the field trip as well, what you do at work, um, it's your brain is malleable. Like we get adaptive to situations. It doesn't mean that it's our natural preference. Um, so whatever we see in any given moment might just be them using that particular function. And we know that everybody is using all the functions. I hope that helps. Nikita and um, Kimberly and Jenny and Hanan. So these questions get to what, what is type good for? Are there specific extrinsic motivational strategies? Um, once you know your type, what's the best way to use it? How can I learn more about myself? Why do we even need to label people, Hanan, if I understand that correctly? So we're not, we're not labeling people as such. It's not about putting people in boxes. Like I said, it's the way that I use personality type is I found it a great source of understanding, a great source of awareness, and um, that helps me in my everyday interactions. It helps me understand that I am not going to be the kind of person that is great at Excel spreadsheets because extroverted thinking, something that would be you know, putting order on the external world and being objective and logical in, in decision-making is just not some, something that comes naturally to me. So now that I know what my preferences are, um, I want to get a more well-rounded person. I have language and specific activities that I can do to get better and to become a more well-rounded person. And um, yeah, this, this ranges from interpersonal relationships, like I said. So I've found it very helpful in my marriage, also in to the point of where I don't take things so personally because we are different people. And when my husband says or does something that might hurt my feelings, I'm not taking it personally in the sense of, I know why he's doing it. I know that that's just how his brain is wired. Does that make sense? So for me, again, it's a tool for development. It's a tool for interpersonal relations. Uh, it can also be used in, in teams, in the workplace. Um, it can be used to help you find more satisfaction at your work, although I'd want to also be very careful around that personality type or the Myers-Briggs instrument, at least. Um, it is unethical to use it for recruitment. If you're ever in a job situation where they say you have to take this test and then we'll decide if you get the job, that is illegal in many states. So don't limit yourself. Just know that the type preferences that you have naturally will give you a natural inclination or a set of um, you know, talents 
to work with that will make certain things easier for you. But you can, you know, all the types do all the jobs, just like all the types have relationships with all the other types. So everything can be done. It's just now with an awareness working of, um, you know, bridging the differences and getting to that next level. And yeah, same for uh, extrinsic motivational strategies. That would be, um, you know, once you know, again, what the type preferences are, then you can you can get into that a little more detail. Uh, David, Erica, and Christina had questions around does the type change? And I think I, I answered that in the video as well. And um, Christina's went a little bit different. She said, since your childhood experience goes into developing your personality, could you say that you can change your core if you are no longer in that environment? And again, I would come back to saying it's a starting point and you don't change the starting point. But with awareness, you can move on from it. And with awareness, you can um, obviously, you know, like therapy is going to be helpful maybe if there are things in a person's childhood. Um, trauma that needs to be overcome or challenges that that led to thinking patterns that are now no longer helpful like that is part of the, your developmental process something I also could have mentioned in the call that I didn't but that I'm going to mention now is personality type or psychological type does not explain everything okay it explains the whole deal um, it explains a whole lot, but it doesn't explain everything of the human condition. There is also um, the, the cultural context. There is also childhood experiences. There is also developmental phases. So a lot of it goes in and we are all, you know, wonderfully made, I believe, is is the quote. Uh, and we are very, very complex. So I would also encourage everyone to hold this theory and any other theories that you hear about the, the human condition lightly. Like don't put, don't go, you know, tattoo your type preferences on your forehead or something. It's uh, something to be used and discard what is not being used. So what is not being helpful. So, um, you know, take it lightly. Natalie said, what about ENTJ, ENFJ? Where do they fit in? Is that extroverted intuiting? So for EN, uh, the intuiting preference is introverted for ENJ types and it is in the second position uh, which is the auxiliary position which is how we try to be helpful. Dr. John Beebe is a Jungian analyst and he liked the eight functions and the order that they are in our consciousness to Jung's archetypes and again that is a whole other uh, session that we can have about that because it's really it's really fascinating. So what EN, since we had a lot of ENFJ types on the call, and since I also have ENFJ preferences, let's talk about that one. Uh, we lead our dominant process is extroverted feeling. So the connection with others. And we balance that out and we try to be helpful with introverted intuiting, which is the foreseeing and knowing how stuff works out. So if you have ENFJ preferences, I'm going to go out here on a limb and say that um, your friends probably come to you with their relationship issues and you tend to have an insight or just an, you know, an awareness or an, an understanding or an inkling of, you know what, this guy is going to be good for you or this girl is not going to work out kind of thing. And that is the connecting in combination with foreseeing the future, if that makes sense. I hope that helps. Um, what is the most important thing in a couple? I answered that on that call. Debbie. The verbal processors. Goodness, thank you. Sorry, that kept me up last night. I should have, I don't know what was happening, but I didn't get there. So yes, um, I am not aware that verbal processing has necessarily to do with thinking or feeling preferences. That is more of an introversion, extroversion thing, I think. And the way that that shows up in communication differences between people with introversion and extroversion preferences is um, people with introversion preferences tend to think before they speak. So whatever they say had a thought process behind it and um, is probably where they have landed on, right? It's that will be the decision or that will be the thing that they believe. Whereas people with extroversion preferences, a lot of us don't know what we think until we hear it. We have to say things out loud. We work stuff out, out here. Our thoughts in here are jumble, jumble, jumble. We don't know what they are, so we have to bring them into the external world, and then we can make sense of them. So what ex people with extroversion preferences say 
is not the last thing, it's the beginning. Do you see how introverts and extroverts communicate with each other? How, because we tend to project of, you know, we tend to think that everybody thinks like us and behaves like us and does the same thing we do. So when an introvert says something, that's what it is. And when an extrovert says something, that's not necessarily what it is. Um, there is a lot of room for, for misinterpretation. And um, so in short, <laughs> seriously, can you tell I have extroversion preferences? So in short, verbal processing is more correlated with an extroversion preference. It fits the extroverted pattern better. Uh, Amina, when we feel we made the right decision, for example, for a breakup, what function is involved? That is probably a variety of things and a combination of things. But um, I would think that if uh, it, it sounds like it might be a consistency judgment, and remember the consistency judgment was introverted feeling where you go inside and take your values and what is important to you into account. And it is a subjective analysis of a certain situation. And then you come out saying whether you like it or dislike it, whether it's right or wrong. So um, deciding when to break up with somebody is a difficult decision. Deciding whether to stay with somebody is a difficult decision and a lot of things go in it. But at the end of the day, if you break up with somebody because you want to stay true to yourself and this relationship is no longer serving your needs, then that might be introverted feeling. If you decide to break up with somebody because you need to move to another state and it doesn't make sense to uproot both your lives, then that might be an extroverted thinking influence. Do you see what I mean? So it depends on um, a lot more factors and you can pinpoint really with one, just one function alone. Uh, from Jenny, what is the letter that follows the four letters, for example, INFP A? I am aware of the, uh, uh, that's probably something from 16personalities.com. Um, that is a different questionnaire. I'm not familiar with the background for it. I'm not familiar with the reliability or the validity. So reliability in terms of do you do people who take that questionnaire consistently have the same result? And the validity is about do the items in the questionnaire measure what they purport to measure, which is something that the Myers-Briggs has a lot of statistical data on because they've been around for so long. Um, I don't know how 16 personalities um, does it and they've added this A or B or whatever it is, A or T, I forget, the, but they've added letters on top. But um, yeah, I don't, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with that instrument. Uh, from Amanda, where does ambivert fall into the Myers-Briggs? So um, I think the background there is that we, if we take a step back, so the Myers-Briggs type indicator came around at a time and was developed around the time, actually in the 40s, but then it came back and was, you know, um, ideated on and was and was further developed kind of in the 50s and 60s, when as a society, people and, you know, sociologists and psychologists and, and, um, and anthropologists, I guess, um, stopped looking at a whole person, at the whole organism, at the whole pattern and broke things apart into individual pieces. So Jung's theory of psychological types is really about patterns and the way that the Myers-Briggs type indicator, the questionnaire that is a tool to get to what the Jungian functions are, the way that it was developed is that it took these patterns apart um, to land on either or, which was quite genius. You know, it was a, it was a great effort, but it doesn't get at the whole pattern, really. So um, the way then that once Myers Briggs became, um, you know, very very um, used by the public and everybody, you know, tried to simplify it, it's. Um, it's easy to to get. I'm sorry, I just checked whether the video was still going. So then now that everybody is using Myers-Briggs and Myers-Briggs has artificially separated these patterns, um, people have the, the language of either or. And I what I tried to, to say and what I tried to show in the in the field trip last night 
it's it's not either or. We use everything. We have all the functions. We just have them in a different order. And we don't use one thing after another. They all happen at the same time. So I hope it's it's not, um, you're not extroverted or introverted. You probably have a preference for having your libido, your mental energy out in the outside world, interacting with the object, or your libido, your mental energy goes into the inside world where you see an object and you reflect on it. And you remember what where you've seen it before, you remember what it was like in the past, you think about things that you can, uh, you know, that probably you can do with them, maybe how it's working out in the future, you think how you feel about it, you, you think about how it fits into a system. And that those are the introverted function, introverted sensing, right? So you have it in your pattern, a general preference to deal with things in the inside world, in your own mind. That then is the attitude of uh, that I, of the four letter type code. But the functions that are connected with it are connected to that introversion thing. So it's never just introversion or extroversion. It's introverted intuiting, and that is combined with extroverted um, thinking or extroverted feeling. That's the bit that we didn't get to in the theory because it gets a little bit more complicated, obviously, because every perception function is in one attitude is balanced with a judgment function in the opposite attitude. And um, I'm, I'm going to leave it there. We, we might just have to do another class, sorry. So yeah, if you want to nerd out about this stuff, I'm up for it and we can definitely go more into details. But everybody is an ambivert in in that you know like common vernacular in the in the way that everybody talks about uh things everybody is an ambivert because you use the functions in the opposite attitudes and i hope that makes sense i've i might i might have confused you more now okay anyway <sighs> um last but not least caitlin what is the best way for an entp and an intj to understand emotion and relationship well okay hallelujah first of all you have the awareness that that's what you want to do. Congratulations. I think that's wonderful. Um, so the an ENTP and an INTJ in a relationship, they're both theorists. So they both have the intuition and the thinking in common. And um, you, uh, ENTP has extroverted intuiting mixed with introverted thinking. And the INTJ has introverted intuiting combined with the extroverted thinking. So your really, your analysis, your logic, your objectivity, your systems thinking, you know, deductive and empirical reasoning is off the charts. And since that is what you do best, uh, maybe if you can look at society as a system or the couple as a system and what makes that system work, wouldn't it make sense to talk about emotions as well, seeing as every human being has them. And you can analyze the emotion, you can talk about the emotion, you can, um, um, you know, think about correlations of actions to emotions, as in, you know, this, there is a framework, maybe when somebody is late, or, uh, you know, like, look at uh, chain reactions, look at patterns that happen. And, um, again, if there is an assumption that, the types both partners want to make their relationship work then maybe there is a logical approach to saying okay how can we change our behavior to have a better outcome right if there is frustration in one of the patterns then why don't we look at where the system breaks down why don't we see which cog we can uh, switch differently and then um, you know you can you can change the outcome and you can change the emotional response without ever having to talk about something as gooey and you know intangible as a feeling um and i hope that was helpful as well and this was another almost 20 minutes okay i'm going to stop here and i'm going to say thank you again thank you christina thank you creative mornings that is something that i wanted to get out out loud um, I really appreciate being part of this community and um, I'm going to see you in another cognitive functions class soon. Thanks.